We are live. Maxine, over to you. Oh, good afternoon. Um, well, good morning and good evening. I think that just about covers everybody who watches this. And thank you so much for watching it. I'm um, getting some good feedback. Any questions you have, please, please ask. So today, as you can see, I am joined by my business partner, Matthew, and to fill in some blanks for David, Matthew is also a dancing diva. He's an operations supremo, and also, more importantly, he's my husband of 32 years. Oh, and by the way, we always said we would never work with each other, so I'm not sure where that goes. Anyway, <laughs> oh, pardon me, not COVID, don't worry. Um, what we're going to talk about today, and why I've asked Matthew to come and join me, is because we're going to talk about EICRs. Oh, we talk about the most amazing things. But the reason is there's a bit of noise in the media with regard to ECIRs. And for once, I'm actually in agreement in, with media in the fact that there is a backlog, there is a building problem. Um, so I am going to pass over to Matthew to just explain the situation, if you would not mind. I will do my best. Good afternoon, morning, evening to those who are watching on recording. So um, why is there this industry-wide backlog on EICRs? Well, let's just remind ourselves, EICR, Electrical Installation Condition Report, it's the MOT for the electrical circuits and wiring in your property. That's all, quite simple. And the government have said for many years they want to make them mandatory instead of best practice. Why? Over half of accidental house fires are caused by electrical faults. 70 people a year die from electrical faults and 330,000 have injuries because of electrical faults. If you assume 20% of properties are rental, that means nearly 70,000 injuries a year are caused by electrical faults in rental properties. Ouch. So we always thought that was a good thing to do. We were just waiting for when. And the government in January said, yeah, they're going to be mandatory. Um, any new tenancy from July 2020 needs one. Great, we can do that. That's lovely. All existing tenancies need them by April 2021. Really? And that's a huge challenge. 82% of our properties need an EICR. And our landlords, you guys, are really good at being compliant and doing the right thing. If you extrapolate our 82% across the whole industry, that's three and a half million rental homes needing an EICR done in just under 14 months. Utterly ridiculous. So why the undue haste from Fenfeld? No government could realistically delay fire safety standards, because that's what they would be seen as, in rental properties without coming under huge political pressure. So they made a decision and we have the joy of living in the wake of it. Welcome to our world, ever will it be that. So the race was on. They told us in January we had to get on with it. We worked out how many properties do we need to do by when? How many is that a month if we keep it even? How many contractors do we need? We got our own contractors to commit to time, volume and prices. We recruited more. Some didn't make the cut, some did. And we ended up with actually quite a good mix and thought, with a fair wind, we'll get them all done by April 2021. It'll be challenged, but it'll be okay. And then COVID happened. COVID lost three, probably four months of access to some properties out of the 14 months. Huge, huge, huge impact. Cannot be underestimated. But what's the impact to you guys, our, our, our landlords? Well, the main issue is you might think we're being a bit slow because the turnaround is ridiculously slow. Some of you have authorised EICRs or remedial works months ago and are still waiting for them, and so are we. Our electricians, I promise you, are working flat out. They're booked, jammed full, all the way through to the end of January already. And, you know, that's a challenge. The adding to, we keep having to reorganise the list because any new remarketing has to be done, be brought to the top of the list, otherwise that property can't start. And add to that, actually, the number of remedial works are much higher than we originally expected. I will come to that later and explain why. I think it's a bit extra fun when contractors try and do the remedial works and they can't get, oh, I don't know, a consumer unit, which is quite important for some of the remedial work. If they can't get the kit, they can't do the work. So despite losing all this time and all these challenges, we've managed to get 45% of our properties done in actually less than 45% of the time once you take out COVID. So we were thinking, okay, but we've still got about 11% of our properties 
where the EICR has been done and we're waiting for the landlord to approve the quotes. That's about 90 properties. Um, and we think actually, if everything goes as it has been and we have a fair wind, then by the end of March, we will still have 13% of our properties to do. That's 13% that will not hit the deadline, despite, I promise you, a huge amount of effort. They'll be done in the two or three months afterwards, so they'll get there, but they won't be done on time. And that assumes no further COVID lockdowns. Discuss, because whether there will be, we'll find out, I guess, in January. Oh, this question, what are we doing about it? Well, we have tried to recruit even more electricians. That's a challenge, because guess what? Everybody's asking for them. Uh, prices seem to just be burgeoning and going higher and higher and higher. Um, and so at the moment, we've taken the view that we're going to stick with the plan we have because we think it is justifiable that we might be a bit late because of COVID. That's our plan. We've also significantly increased capacity in our team. There's 30% more capacity in our property management team than there was in January, all for EICRs. They are taking time to manage the contractors, process the reports, check them, I'll come to that in a bit, making sure that they have time to talk through with you guys on the quotes and I'll help you answer any questions. That's what we're trying to do. And then finally, and actually probably one of the most important things, we are lobbying through our trade associations, ARLA and DNRLA, and also through our seat on the Letting Industry Council, which is an advisory body to government departments, um, to have the deadline extended from April 2021 by six months to October. Not a huge deal, but that would seem to be sensible given the COVID situation. Whether they do or not, who knows? We suspect they might not, but then they just will quietly not prosecute people, which is really not helpful. Anyway, that's where we got to. Fine, eh? Excellent, excellent. So, I mean, you said you were going to come back, but one of my questions was, was why, why the massive remedial work? Because I get, again, it, you know, it, I think it's been a surprise to everybody. Yeah, and, and so I did say I'd come back on that. Um, I said it's like an MOT, and we've all had an MOT where I will only pass if you have the light bulb fixed or this is needs fixing there's a list of remedial works to cause you to pass the MOT. But we have an MOT every year. If you did an MOT every 10 years, there would be a longer list of works to be done. And it's kind of the same for our rental properties. Now, what do we do on rental properties? We spend money on the things that will improve street appeal, better bathroom, better kitchen, nicer carpet, bit of decor, lovely. We spend money on things that are necessary, a boiler, because people like to be warm and you don't want to have to keep spending money on a broken one. But if things are working, we leave them. And the electrics have been working fine for 15, 20 years. Why would I do anything with them? Which is perfectly reasonable, except the electrical safety standards, like all other safety standards, get higher and higher all the time. So a property that met the safety standards 10, 15, 20 years ago now needs a lot of work in order to make the current standards. That's the problem. What's really interesting is most of us do not have an EICR done in our own homes. And I suspect if we did, we would find we're living in homes that don't meet the current safety standards. That's our choice. If we want to electrocute ourselves, our choice. But if we are charging people for homes, then we need to make sure they meet the standards. That's why it's different. You might want to scare yourself and have an EICR done at your home. Please don't use up contractors to do so. We need them. I think we're about to scare ourselves, aren't we? So, <laughs> so you said we've got 30% capacity. So it's like, right, we've put people there. What do we actually do with an EICR? Mm. They, they, they can be a guaranteed cure for insomnia. They run to several pages. <laughs> it, it is anal levels of detail that electricians find interesting. The interesting and important stuff for us normal people is the bit of paper, the page that says, here's the various attributes and it gives them a code of C1, C2, C3. C1, immediate danger, must be fixed. And if the electrician can't fix it there and then they have to shut the system down. Happily, very few of those. C2, risk of danger, must be fixed within 28 days and the rules require 28 days. That's the remedial works. C3, a recommendation of something that could be considered and could be done. So we get that, we check the report, we make sure we understand what they've said and it covers all the angles. We make sure we have quotes for the C2s separate from the C3s. We make sure we check those quotes against 
other quotes that you know we make sure it's all of the right price price band it isn't suddenly inflated for some reason and then we have to have a conversation with you guys to break the good news to you that there's a quote for what could be quite a lot of money and explain it to you now you'll probably need time to think about it okay fine so we're worried about the 28 days so we're then creating a system to make sure we speak to you so we don't miss the 28 days and inevitably when landlords do cross check the quotes they are finding a problem that we are finding with our own contractors in that someone who holds the qualification to do the EICRs, if they go into a building to do some work, there is the chance that they are considered to have approved the quality and accuracy of the EICR that's just been done because they were the most recent qualified person on site. Many electricians are saying they're not prepared to do that. They're only prepared to do the works if they do the EICR. And that's presenting a bit of a challenge, even getting duplicate quotes. Other than that, it's fine. It's fine. Mm. Well, I think just as an aside, I think you've just called the electricians the guys who work with not normal people. So they might be getting special <laughs> Christmas presents. We think you're normal people, don't worry. Um, so what happens if there's no EICR in place come April? Um, in theory, the local authority can enforce the EICR and can offer a penalty or impose a penalty of up to, brace yourself, £30,000. Now, you know, clearly, if you're two days late on the EICR, you're not going to get a fine. Um, the £30,000 is going to be for the serial, bad, naughty people who, where people have died and all the other really bad stuff. However, none of us want to be there going, oh, oh I wonder if I'm going to be prosecuted which is why we want the deadline extended, because we'd much rather have the deadline extended and know that when the deadline has been hit, then the local authority can do their job to just start monitoring and make sure it happens. The other though, the other um, issue is that if you don't have all of your paperwork in place, including the ERCR, then if you want to evict your tenant, you might not be able to, because the process of eviction through the court requires you to prove all the documents are in place. And if your EICR isn't there, you might not be able to. So that's a challenge. Um, and, and today, there's a document we have to issue called the How to Rent Guide. Has to go out, new ones come out today. So if tomorrow a tenancy starts and you give them the How to Rent Guide from May, May last year, which was the last version, you may not be able to get somebody out. It's that sort of level of detail. Mm, yes, it came out, what was it, 10 past 10 this morning. So yes. we're in negotiations with regard to the check-in that went in at 10 o'clock this morning. <laughs> so, but what about uh, the, uh, the guys who were our landlords? Um, you guys, could you do your own work? Could they do their own work? Yeah, uh, they can. And 9% of our landlords are. And we, we find ourselves in the strange position of loving them for it, because usually we're really happy to do the work, because that's what we're paid to do. But that nine percent is taking capacity out of our contractors and not taking capacity is giving capacity to our contractors is taking the pressure off the team we're really delighted provided they are contractors who are qualified to do the job and have the right insurance so our landlords are properly protected provided they arrange the access with the tenants the arrangements we have with our contractors is that they organize the access with the tenants they make sure they deal with all that they don't expect us to be run around for them to be their secretaries if your contractors do, we'll be charging for it and they get a bit upset about that. And provided they understand the timetables, that's, that's all that's needed to make sure that you get what you need when you need it, that's all. Um, but no, many do. Um, some have tried to take that route, thinking, no, no, I can do it myself, found it's very difficult because actually contractors are in short supply, and then come back and they then lost their slot with our contractor. And so they've actually gone to the back of the queue, which is a bit of a pain, frankly. But no, Ouch. many do. And please, please, if you want to, lovely. Thank you. We do have to then chase you to make sure it turns up. Otherwise, yeah, we, we're not doing anything. Oh, I'm sure we don't have to chase anybody because everybody <laughs> is perfect. Encourage so, documents to come back to us. Absolutely. So fun, fun, fun all around. But the takeout that I'm hearing that the pressure is on and the media is right to say, there is a backlog going on. There is an issue here. Um, and we're living in the wake of that. We're living in the wake of the fact that we've lost 20% of the time available to get it done. 
Um, also, some of the parts, I understand, they're just not available or they're in short supply. So that's holding things up. So it really is a case, I suppose, what I would like to say to, to anyone who's listening to sort of thinking about, well, why are you asking me to spend money now when I don't need it until April, is that we've just got to make sure that you are going to be covered in April. That's our absolute driver. So please don't get grumpy with us. Um, and I suppose really that is it. Although it's sort of like, we are doing it. But thank you so much for that because I know that came out of a meeting that we had as with the, the directors of the company just going, well, where are we? What's going on? And it's like, oh, okay, it's true there. So that is it for today. Thank you so much, as I said, for listening. I hope it's been of interest. I hope it's cleared up some of the mist as to why we might be chasing you. And thank you and see you next week. And as I always say in here, make sure you wash your hands. Oh, and keep distance and don't hug people. Thank you very much. And Thanks good afternoon. Well. See you, people. Bye.